Counselor, are you ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court. Opposing counsel. Members of the jury, it's been said that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. But Alan Blazar can tell you from experience that here in the state of Lone Star, we've got something worse. And that's the fury of a scorned woman and a scorned man who teamed up to seek revenge against the one person that humiliated them both. And revenge is what this case is all about. See, we've learned from the evidence in this case that on Wednesday, June 2, 2004, Alan Blizzard was in the skating rink he owns here in Armadillo preparing for the evening skating session. We've learned that there's an ATM machine in that same rink purchased from the victim in this case, Adam McKenzie. And we've learned that Alan Blizzard planned to get rid of that ATM machine and that he fought with the victim on June 2nd when he informed him of his decision. But see, we've also learned that Joe Kabinsky, a carpet salesman, was also in the rink that day replacing the skating rink's carpet. We've learned that Kubinski's wife, Christy, had recently left him because she was having an affair with Adam McKenzie. And we've learned that Kubinski left the skating rink soon after McKenzie did, and that the police would discover McKenzie's dead body the next day in a dumpster behind Kubinski's own carpet business, shot in the back of the head with a bullet from McKenzie's own gun. Now, the state adds all that up. And they want you to come to the conclusion that somehow it's Alan Blizzard who's responsible. And it's true, Alan Blizzard is not a perfect man. They've told you on no less than four occasions throughout this trial that he's a convicted felon. But they're not giving you the whole picture. They're not telling you the whole story. They didn't want to tell you that Alan Blizzard's conviction occurred seven years ago when he was an attorney in the state of New York. They didn't want to tell you that as a result of his job, he became depressed, developed a severe drinking problem, and that the crime he committed happened when he drove his own car into what he thought was his own unoccupied law building at 2 o'clock in the morning while he was intoxicated. Now, a member of the janitorial staff was actually there, and they were killed in that accident. So Alan Blizzard pled guilty to manslaughter, was disbarred from the state of New York, and will forever have to wear the badge of being a convicted felon. But what the state didn't want to tell you is that he received treatment for his depression after that event, received treatment for his alcoholism, has not only been sober, but has had a spotless criminal record in the seven years since. They also didn't want to tell you that at no time in his life, before or since that night, has Alan Blazard ever been convicted of, charged with, or accused of a crime of dishonesty. Because for them to admit that to you, they'd have to admit to themselves that even though Alan Blazard is not a perfect man, he's an honest man. He knows the meaning of a solemn oath, an oath he took to become an attorney in the state of New York, and one he took when he stood here at this very witness stand, placed his hand on the Holy Scripture and swore to God above to tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that's what he did. He admitted to you that he has a criminal record. He admitted to you that he fought with the victim, and he admitted to you that he left the skating rink soon thereafter so he could go to the gym to blow off steam. But he also told you that when he came back, he saw Joe Kubinski's tools and carpet scraps strewn all over the skating rink in a haphazard fashion. He told you that he had never before seen the note with its pretty cursive handwriting that the state introduced into evidence and that he had nothing at all to do with McKenzie's murder. And you didn't just hear it from him. You also heard from Casey Snyder, an employee in the rink that night. She told you she also saw Kubinski leave in a hurry soon after McKenzie did, leaving his tools behind, leaving just after 3.30 p.m. Now, members of the jury, when Kubinski was on this stand, he told you that he called police as soon as he discovered that his van was missing. But Detective Richardson told you that call didn't come in until 4.42 p.m. Ask yourselves, what happened in that hour between when he discovered his van was missing and when he actually called police? The forensic evidence in this case tells you and I'm not talking about the fingerprints the police supposedly found on the steering wheel of the van left there weeks prior. God forbid anyone ever sell a car and something happened to the new owner because as far as this police department's concerned, that's enough to convict you of a crime. I'm talking about Adam McKenzie's own fingerprint found on the casing of the bullet that killed him. Ask yourselves, how does someone shot in the back of the head, falling forward, 
get their fingerprint on the bullet casing that went out to the side? And the answer is that it was his own bullet shot from his own gun, taken from his own car that was accessible only by his own wife. Alan Blizzard didn't know Andrea McKenzie. Alan Blizzard never had access to that car. But she, know Joe, she knew Joe Kubinski. She knew him because her husband had been cheating with his wife. The two of them paired up to make this execution happen against the one person that he had humiliated them both. Now, in a few minutes, the judge will instruct you about the law to apply to this case, and I want you to listen closely when he tells you the state must prove each element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. That is the highest standard we use to weigh guilt or innocence in this country. And we can't put a mathematical precision to it. 90% certainty is not enough. Because even if you're 90% certain that Alan Blizzard is guilty, you're 10% doubt. 90% justice, 10% injustice. That's more than our system is willing to tolerate. But I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that you understand reasonable doubt intuitively. If at any time during this trial, during these arguments, or during your deliberations, you find yourself asking, I wish the state had presented more evidence about the hour Joe Kubinski can't account for, about the note they never submitted for a handwriting analysis, about the arsenic found in the dead man's body, or about his wife with her $1 million life insurance policy. If you think the state should have presented more evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that's reasonable doubt. And it is written all over this case. This was a case about revenge. It was about a scorned woman and a scorned man teaming up to seek revenge against the one person that humiliated them both. Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Blizzard knows there are things worse than the fear of a woman scorn. Now, after hearing this case, you know better as well. Tell the state they should know better, too. Return the only verdict justified by the evidence in this case, members of the jury. Find Alan Blizzard not guilty of theft and find him not guilty of first-degree murder. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor.